This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by the Deck of Many and their amazing Big Bad Booklet series. This booklet is a monthly release that includes all the information, lore, imagery, and stat blocks that you need to run an epic boss monster in 5th edition. Available as both a digital print and play and in hard copy, this month's release features the God of Kings, a terrible entity in prison in a stone prison for their attempt to try to take over the Divine Pantheon. Every monthly release has a print and play PDF and all the reference cards that you need to role play and run an incredible epic boss battle at your game table. So check it out in the description below or head to bigbadbooklet.com to sign up now. And now, onto this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. So we've been delving into the brand new book for Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Last week we looked at the new spells, and this week we are going to take a look at the new feats. There are 16 of them in this book. Let's see what they do. We're going to be looking at all 16 feats today, and we are going to be giving our ranking system based on whether we think the feat is a must-have, is good, is niche, or is bad. We're going to just give our initial reactions to what we think these feats are good at and who we think they are good for. One of the cool things about all the feats in this book, though, is that almost all of them, there's a few exceptions, also come with a plus one ability score boost, usually to an ability score defined by the feat. So that raises the stocks for a lot of these feats because they're always half of an ability score increase, which can be quite valuable when you gotta round up one of those odd ability scores. So let's bust open this new book and look at the amazing feats presented. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So the first feat is Artificer Initiate, which basically reads like Magic Initiate, but for Artificer spells. You get an Artificer Cantrip, you get a first level Artificer spell of your choice, and you can also cast that first level spell once per day without using a spell slot, and then use your regular spell slots to cast it. You can also use Artisan Tools as a spell casting focus. All these spells are based on your intelligence score for your spell casting ability. Pretty, pretty niche feat, I think. I was even willing to say it might be bad. I don't really know what makes this feat stand out to me. I don't know what you're going to take from Artifice or Initiate that you're not going to get from Magic Initiate Wizard, because there's a pretty big overlap between the two. That said, this could be a sneaky way for a wizard to get some of the artificer cantrips that wizards don't get. Maybe there's a case to be made for an Eldritch Knight or Arcane Trickster taking this to get a specific cantrip or first level spell from the artificer list, but nothing really stuck out to me as being a particularly must-have about this feat. My thoughts on this feat are that it is tacked on here in an attempt to bring artificers more into the foreground because they were a later addition to the game. That's all that this feat feels like to me. Yeah, it's it's fine, but if you weren't going to take Magic Initiate, you're probably not going to take this feat either. Next up, we have Chef. Chef allows you to increase your constitution or wisdom score by one to a maximum of 20. You gain proficiency with cook's utensils if you don't already have it. During a short rest, you can prepare food to help heal your teammates and you can create treats to give to them later to gain temporary hit points. These temporary hit points only equal your proficiency modifier though. People are gonna love this feat because people love cooking and I love food and I love eating treats. I think this feat is bad. I was willing to give it niche. I think it's straight up worse than Inspiring Leader for almost everybody. Inspiring Leader gives temporary hit points equal to your level, which is way better than temporary hit points equal to your proficiency modifier, and that will probably also outstrip the extra healing that you get from this. So this is basically giving up a lot of what Inspiring Leader gives you to get a plus one to your Wisdom or Constitution, which are key ability scores. Take this one for funsies, but it's a bad feat in my book. 
You might be right. Um, I want to like Chef because I love the role play potential behind this. Um, but I probably wouldn't pick it over most other feats available. So We've talked about this with each other. I think that proficiency in Chef's tools should just do this. <laughs> I agree. I, this is an attempt to make a tool more valuable because tools don't have enough value in D&D. Yeah. I really like the chef feat, but I don't know if I would take it. So next up, we come to the first of three of the weapon-based feats, and that is Crusher, which is all about the bludgeoning damage. You increase your strength or constitution by one when you take the feat. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with a, an attack that deals bludgeoning damage... You can move it five feet to an unoccupied space. And finally, when you score a critical hit with an attack that does bludgeoning damage, attacks against that creature are made with advantage until the end of your next turn. All right, here, here we go. This feat, in my opinion, is good, but if you're playing a monk, it's a must-have. If you're playing a monk, this feat is amazing. You get to knock people around with your fists all the time. And the critical hit thing is just gravy for you. This is a must-take feat for a monk, I think. Absolutely. I think otherwise it's good. If you're playing a character that relies on bludgeoning damage specifically, then yeah, this feat might be the must-have option for you. I'm going to point out as well that this feat doesn't restrict itself to weapons. So if you have some other way of dealing bludgeoning damage, damage, perhaps with a spell, you can use this feat with it. I didn't think of that. Next up, we have Eldritch Adept. This feat does have a prerequisite. You need to either have spellcasting or the packed magic feature. So you're either going to be a warlock or another spellcaster. This feat lets you choose an Eldritch Invocation. There is one important sentence here that you need to take note of, though, and that is the sentence, if the invocation has a prerequisite of any kind, you can choose that invocation only if you're a warlock who meets the prerequisite. To clarify, many Eldritch Invocations, such as Agonizing Blast, which boosts the damage on Eldritch Blast or Forceful Blast or anything like that, these don't have any level requirements, but they do require you to know Eldritch Blast. By the wording of this feat, even if you were a non-warlock that knew Eldritch Blast, you wouldn't be able to take Agonizing Blast. You can only take the Eldritch Invocations that have absolutely no prerequisites whatsoever if you aren't a warlock already. I made a list, I went through the books. So up on screen, here's the full list. So out of these invocations, there is one that I think makes this a pretty standout feat still. And that is the ability to take Devil's Sight. The ability to just be able to take a feat and now see in magical darkness can be game-changing for certain classes. I know that we've already thrown it out to the monks before, but a shadow monk who could see in their own darkness would be way better. Lots of, lots of classes that are built around the darkness spell could be enabled by being able to take this feat. And if you've got that build in mind, I think this is a must-have. I also think that this is just a must-have feat for Warlocks, because they don't get a lot of Eldritch Invocations, and they're staggered across your level progression. And there's a couple times as a Warlock where you really want to get one of them a lot earlier, or pick up a couple of the extra higher level ones. And in those specific cases, particularly involving Devil Sight and Darkness combinations, might be some must-haves in there. So next up, we come to the Fey Touched feat. This allows you to increase your intelligence, wisdom, or charisma score by one, and allow and also grants you the Misty Step spell that you can use using whatever spellcasting ability modifier you chose to boost with this feat. But you also get to learn an enchantment or divination spell of first level of your choice, which spellcasting ability is tied to the feat as well. You can cast both Misty Step and this spell without using a spell slot once, but then you can also use your regular spell slots to cast these spells. This is a pretty good feat. Uh, you could get Hunter's Mark or Hex with this feat. I think this is good. I don't think it's uh, groundbreaking or must-have, but I think that there are reasons why you might want to pick this feat up. I think this is a perfect feat to round off uh, a 17 or a 19 in your Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma to boost that up. So if you're playing a variant human or the custom lineage, this would be a really great feat to consider at first level to just round out your ability scores. And... In addition to that, 
I think that there's some interesting combos that could be enabled by taking this feat. I think it's good. Next up, we have Fighting Initiate. The prerequisite for this one is proficiency with a martial weapon. So you only need to be able to use like a long sword or something. Yeah. Okay. And it allows you to choose one fighting style option of your choice from the fighter class. Luckily, the fighters get majority of the fighting options available. And whenever you reach a level that grants an ability score improvement, you can replace this feat's fighting style with another one from the fighter class that you don't have. I think this is niche. I think that there's some characters that might want this. Again, there's now the new fighting style that gives you a very short range blind sight. So again, if you're a class that's going to use like a fog cloud effect or a darkness effect and you need to be able to see in the area of your own spell, if you're going to use a combo like that, this could rise the stock of this. Also, it just might be cool to take a character that doesn't normally get the archery fighting style but is going to play a sharpshooter. They might want this. Um, there's some martial based classes like barbarians and hex blades and blade singers that don't normally get a fighting style but might love to have one. If you're looking for a specific character build, this might be a great choice. And there are builds out there that could use this feat to do really cool things. But I think those are limited. And for those people, it's going to be amazing, but it's not for everybody. So, next up, we got Gunner. You increase your dexterity by one. You get proficiency with firearms, you ignore their loading property, uh, and you don't have disadvantage on attack rolls, uh, ranged attack rolls when creatures are within five feet of you. This is crossbow expert for guns with the bonus action shaved off, and in instead giving you a plus one to dexterity. I think this is niche. It really depends on the place of firearms in your campaign setting. That That's really it. It's like this is a feat that's only an option in certain campaigns. Yeah. And that, that really is the limit of it. Do you have firearms in your campaign? This might be a great pick. Do you not have firearms in your campaign? Then ignore this feat. Yeah. I wonder if this feat is any good for like Matt Mercer's Gunslinger. Maybe. Next up, we come to Metamagic Adept. The prerequisite here being you either have spellcasting or packed magic features. And you get to learn two metamagic options of your choice from the sorcerer class. And you get two sorcery points to use on those metamagic features. Those sorcery points come back on a long rest only. And you don't get the sorcerer's ability to like convert your spell slots into sorcery points. So you only get two. You know who this is a must have for? Sorcerers. Yeah, this is amazing for sorcerers. Like this is the must have feat. You should take this as a sorcerer at level four so that you get two more doubling your number of metamagics, giving you extra metamagic points to use on your metamagic abilities. Getting more metamagic options for a sorcerer is really good. For everybody else role, you got a problem. You only got two sorcery points. So you have to be really choosy with your metamagics because some of them actually cost more than two yeah. sorcery points for their best features. I might take something like, um, Empowered spell and uh, subtle spell. Yeah, and then you get to subtle or empower two spells. And I'm not convinced that being able to quicken a spell once per day is worth a feat. I will tell you who it's worth it for, other than sorcerers. Warlocks. That might be so. Warlocks have a limited number of spells that they can use. Being able to add mm -hmm. metamagic to the limited casting they already get is going to be really useful. So I think yeah. Sorcerers and Warlocks, this is a must-have. So next up is Piercer, which gives you plus one to your strength or dexterity. Once per turn, when you hit a creature with a piercing a piercing damage attack, you can reroll one of the attack's damage die, and when you score a critical hit, you deal an extra die of damage with piercing attacks. Is this, this is really good. Is this must-have for rogues? This is must-have for rogues. Because, or... Any ranged character? I, I think rangers could benefit from Piercer. I think like anybody who's a dexterity-based fighter, because uh, if you're using bows, and then if you get into trouble in close hands, you're usually using a rapier or something of that sort. Th th this is a very useful feat. I think it's a must-have yeah. for dexterity-based combatants. I think if you're playing a crossbow expert sharpshooter, this is your third feat. Yeah. 
and this is the feat, and hopefully you get a plus two to your dexterity, and so this is the feat that rounds you up to 18 or 20 on your dexterity, and then you're sailing from there. Uh, yeah, this is a this is a total must have. Next up, we have Poisoner. This adds a few attributes to the poisoning options available in Dungeons and Dragons. Now, when you make a damage roll that deals poison damage, it ignores resistance to poison damage. You can apply poison to a weapon or piece of ammunition as a bonus action instead of an entire action. Pretty helpful. And you gain proficiency with the Poisoner's Kit if you don't already have it. You can also make a number of vials of poison equal to your proficiency bonus that do 2d8 poison damage on a failed DC 14 constitution save. I want to like this feat. I want to love this feat. Most monsters are immune to poison damage, not resistant to it. There are a lot of monsters that are resistant, um, but it's almost like five to one, the ratio of resistance versus immunity. Bypassing that resistance is not as valuable as it might otherwise be. I think this is a niche feat. I, I can agree with, with niche. My, my problem is that, and I've said this so many times, I want to love the aspect of poison existing in Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. I want more classes that do stuff with poison. I want people to use poison. I think it's really cool. I think the idea of poisoning your weapons is really neat. And I think this feat almost got there. Yeah. I just, I wish there was something more that we could do with poison. And I, this, this tries, but it doesn't fully succeed. I think that there needs to be a feat that lets you brew like a poison that does necrotic damage. I would take this for a very special type of character who is focused, like if I'm making a character like the Witcher who's brewing poisons to take out foes, then yeah, cool. So next up we have the Shadow Touched feat, which is in many ways the shadow twin of Fey Touched. Same ability store boost, plus one to intelligence, wisdom, or charisma. But instead of Misty Step, you get invisibility. And instead of choosing from enchantment or divination as a first level spell, you choose from any necromancy or any illusion spell. I think that Shadow Touched is niche because invisibility is a good spell. It's a, one of my favorite spells in the game. But it is harder in its wide scale application than Misty Step as a spell. And the spells that you can take at first level from the schools of, in, of illusion and necromancy are much more narrow than the spells for Fey Touched. With Fey Touched, you could get Bless, Bane, or Hunter's Mark. There's a lot of like crazy good stuff that you could get there. What do you get with Shadow Touched? What? Color Spray or Inflict Wounds? Okay. I, false life? I, I was going to give this good because in my mind it was just like the, the dark, scary version of Fey Touched. But I see your point. I see your point. Yeah, I, I, th I think Fey Touched is the better of the two. Uh, I think it just offers more potential. Shadow Touched isn't bad. It's just niche because you have to want something specific from it. And I think that more characters are going to be like, oh, I want to get Bless. I want to get Hunter's Mark. I want to get Misty Step than they are gonna be about invisibility and inflict wounds. So next up we have Skill Expert. This one's a pretty standard feat. You get to increase an ability score of your choice by one up to a total of 20. You gain proficiency in one skill of your choice and you can take a skill that you're proficient with and give yourself expertise in that skill. I think this is a pretty bread and butter feat and I, I'm willing to say that it's, it's good. I think it's niche. Yeah? If you're rounding up an ability score, let's say you're playing any character, is how many feats would you rather take instead of this feat? Okay, true, 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 true. Um, like, I, if you have something specific in mind, if you need to have expertise in a specific skill because that's going to really define your character in an important way and you need to bump up one of your ability scores by one, perfect. That's niche. That is the definition of a niche. Yeah, I would probably pick a lot of other things before yeah. this. So next up we come to the third and final of the three weapon damage typey feats. But remember, you don't necessarily have to use them with weapons because they don't say weapons, just slashing damage or attacks that deal slashing damage. Slasher, boost your strength or dexterity by one. When you hit a creature once per turn with an attack that does slashing damage, you reduce their speed by 10 feet and when you score a critical hit against them, 
they have disadvantage on all their attack rolls until the, the uh, until the start of your next turn. Slashing damage is probably one of the higher ones for for melee yeah. combatants. Yeah, it's is it good or is it must have? Guess what all the good slashing damage weapons are. Two handed weapons. Guess what people that with two handed weapons want to take. Great weapon master. Great weapon master. Possibly pull arm fighting if you're if you're taking yeah. a pull arm. This I still okay. I, I'm willing to say that this is highly good. It's your it, it, it's your second or third choice for a feat. It is. If I was using a great sword or a great axe, would I take this over a great weapon master? No. Um, would you take it to complement great weapon master? Yes. Yes, but then you run into that tricky situation of where are all all your ability score boosts coming from, right? Now this might be really cool as well though for a sword and board character because it reduces speed. So I could see a really interesting character that uses this and sentinel and a long sword and a shield. And now you're kind of cooking with gas because if you're a defensive character, if you're that frontline bulwark, giving your enemy disadvantage on attack rolls on a critical hit helps you out defensively and slowing their speed down stops them from getting away. So I think this sentinel, defensive based character, shield, longsword. Next up we have telekinetic. Telekinetic lets you increase your intelligence, wisdom, or charisma score by one up to a total of 20. You learn the mage hand cantrip and it is an invisible mage hand, which is really cool. And as a bonus action, you can telekinetically shove creatures around five feet here and there, which can have a lot of really useful applications. They get a strength saving throw to resist this against a spell saving throw DC that is basically calculated based on whatever ability score you boosted. I, I think this is good. I think I this, think is, this is a must have. Yeah? This is a crazy good feat. Dude, if you're a wizard, what are you doing with your bonus action as a wizard? Exactly. Exactly. What do you want to do all the time as a wizard? Shove people around. Into your awful battlefield control effects. Shove people into prismatic wall. Shove people... Exactly. Prismatic wall, bump. Web. Bump. Wall of fire, bump. Oh, those two enemies, I can't get them both in my force cage. Boop. The chess player brain of the battlefield control wizard is salivating at the possibility of this spell. Okay, okay. Even if you're not a spellcaster and you're fighting some dudes that are on a bridge above you and they're shooting at you with arrows and you just go boop and knock them off the bridge. And an invisible mage hand is always useful. Yeah. Mage Hand is one of the most versatile cantrips in the game. Having it be invisible? Okay, all right, I'm sold. This is a must yeah. have. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's amazing. So finally we come to Telepathic. Again, Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma by one. You can speak telepathically to any creature you can see within 60 feet. They're always in a language you know, um, and the target has to understand that language, and it can't respond to you telepathically. And you can cast Detect Thoughts requiring no spell slots or components, which means you can cast detect thoughts without verbal, somatic, and material components, so people can't see you casting detect thoughts. That could be very useful in many circumstances. You can do that once per day, but then you can use spell slots afterwards to keep casting detect thoughts. Good. I want to say that this is a good feat, I do think it's niche in a little bit because I think telekinetic kind of pushes it over. But I like it. I really want to make a character that is telekinetic, telepathic, mind sliver, Tasha's mind whip, synaptic static, wall of force, and is maybe a clockwork soul sorcerer. I don't want to DM for you. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. Yeah, I think it's really good. Overall, I think this offers a bunch of awesome feat options. I think the biggest problem now is that we have so many amazing feats in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, and we don't have enough slots to take these feats. This makes me want to play a fighter. A weird fighter that has, like, slasher and telekinesis and, like, just random feats. Let's throw Chef in there too. I don't know. Why not? Let's let's mm. let's go crazy with some feats. There's some really fun options, and even the ones that we didn't like as much as the others still have fun roleplay applications mm -hmm. or are applicable to certain builds. I think that the feats in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything 
have once again, just like a lot of things in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, broadened the potential for versatility in character creation in Dungeons & Dragons. So many of these feats come with a plus one ability score modifier that there's no reason not to take them as long as you're rounding up that ability score or rounding up another one. And generally speaking, most characters are going to be able to take these feats because you're going to have an odd ability score of some kind somewhere. (laughs) So that in the context of all these feats means that the good feats are really easy to take. It really is the question of, can you get this in while maxing out your primary ability score? Should you take this feat instead of maxing out your ability score, primary ability score? I don't think that... I, I think that all of these feats, for the most part, I still want them to either contribute to maxing out my ability score or come later so that I can max out a secondary. Yeah. There's only a handful of these like Metamagic Adept, that I would truly take ahead of an ability score increase. That's fair. But that that's the argument with feats in general, yeah. is what you're going to do at those level up options. Yeah. I think it's great. I think these are great feats, and I think you should consider looking into the options presented in this book. So this has been our rankings on the feats in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Tell us what your favorite feats in this book are in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. A big thank you from Kelly and I to all of you out there on Patreon. And if you enjoy our work, consider joining us on our Patreon community by following the links in the description below. And don't forget to check out our live play, Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. You can find all the previous episodes of that campaign right up over here. We've got plenty more coverage on Tasha's Cauldron of Everything coming up right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.